It's time for the Josh Kirby on Sports Podcast. COVID-19 keeping you indoors? Don't worry, we have a cure for that cabin fever of yours. Coming up next on the Josh Kirby on Sports Podcast, a free agency in review. We'll be taking a look inside some of the biggest and best deals, plus some of the worst deals through this NFL free agency so far. All coming up next. Stay tuned. This is Dave Johnson, voice of the Washington Wizards. You have connected to the right place because you are listening to my man, Josh Kirby, on Sports Podcast. I would like to apologize in advance just in case there are any technical difficulties throughout any point of this recording of the podcast. We tried a three-man call setup for a free agency edition of the Josh Kirby on Sports Podcast. It all starts right now. All righty, back with you for another edition of the Josh Kirby on Sports Podcast. I'm really, really excited for this one. We have a full slate for you today. Before we begin, we're part of the Mayo Please podcast network. You can check them out on all streaming platforms along with Instagram and Twitter. We're sponsored by Route 11 Chips. Make sure you find the bag today inside your local Martin's Food Lion and Giant stores. We're also sponsored by PM Plus Reserves. As always, want to give a big thanks to JR Beats Official MPT Now Productions in Dave Johnson for all they do for the Josh Kirby on Sports Podcast. It's a big show. We don't have we have not one but two calling guests due to COVID nineteen. We are all on the phone here, um, with good reason. Starting off, Dan Dembski back with us. Uh, Dan, um. You work in a hospital. Has that taken an effect on your ability to work or anything? Anything crazy going on, or what? what what's going on in your world? Uh, well, I was off this week because uh, our online classes kicked back in. Um, so I've I've been trying to keep up with everything, and um, I think there's four or five confirmed cases right now in our hospital, which uh, is quite unsettling, but. You know, I I just think the way to go is to just take all the proper precautions and do do everything that the um, you know, especially the CDC and all those organizations are telling people to do. And um, yeah, yeah. Right now, I'm just trying to focus on my classes and uh, probably work a couple of couple days next week. But uh, yeah, it's it's crazy, man. Um, there's definitely things that uh, you know the hospital can do to um, to sort of try to keep everybody healthy but you know, i mean there's going to be stuff that sneaks through that's just going to be how it is so yeah a- absolutely and um n- news came out the other day virginia tech i'm not sure about other colleges but they're hosting a virtual gradu- graduation mm-hmm. yep that's correct there's yeah. not a lot of information about it yet um i think they're still trying to work work out the kinks but yeah it's I'm not too thrilled about it, if I can be honest. Um, I mean, but, they should provide you a real graduation. Yeah, and there was a petition started that you know a lot of people have signed. I've signed myself um, about having a real graduation, whether it be even next year at this point, because um, you know it takes quite quite a uh, amount of ha- of hours um, to get that sort of thing going. So, yeah, it's it's frustrating, but uh, you know this this whole thing is just so so weird and so new for everyone so um just kind of have to roll with the punches i mean yeah i mean everybody's doing the right thing don't get me wrong but um Mm -hmm. just make sure everybody stay safe out there stay safe um and once again the josh kirby on sports podcast we are we have thoughts and prayers going out to anybody 
and everybody affected by COVID-19. So, Dan, glad you're with us on this episode. Our next guest, um, we've had him on before during football season, a long hiatus because, you know, um, uh, my buddy Jason Kamlowski, he is first a very great sports blogger, but most off a dope principal he it, it, he's like the legend and he's joining us today um jason first off good to hear from you good to um talk to you sir but um you, you're a high school principal and your school district has been affected by covid19 um what are your thoughts about this yeah josh i mean it's hard um we've been off school for about two years now um the the state has put us out for april 20th uh it's you know hard to say what will happen then i mean they've they've extended our break um they first said we we're going to be out till march 27th which is today and then the other day they came out and said april 20th you know it's 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 a challenge because you know you're trying to do distance learning um not like college level where kids have you know internet access you know, we have some kids who don't um you know, and it's hard to get them work consistently, especially when the staff can't come into our building because it's on lockdown. So it, it's been a challenge, but I I really got to say my staff has done an outstanding job. Um, you know, we we had our cooks in there today bagging lunches for for thousands of kids. Um, you know, custodians in there cleaning the building every chance they get. I mean, it's it's just been a total team effort and. Absolutely, Jason. So what we're glad uh you're with us as well. That might have cut out a little bit, but um uh anyways, we're glad you're with us as well, Jason. Well, once again, Jason's with Dynasty Football Digest and Prospects Live writing for um the um MLB blog in the um NFL talking dynasty. He's talked on our podcast before Jason has about fantasy football, dynasty, best ball, all that. So if you take a listen back at our previous episodes during the football season, um, you can hear Jason in all his past fantasy football files. So gentlemen, um, enough with the chit chat. It's time to talk free agency NFL football. Um, it's, uh, I mean, with COVID going on and everything, we still have free agency. It hit us and it hit us good. And there's a lot of news to talk about. So I think let's get started. Who's with me here? Let's get it, man. Let's, let's get it started. So, um, Dan, um, I, I want to start with you on the Baltimore Ravens getting Calais Campbell at a huge discount only only like a fifth year pick for Calais Campbell from the Jaguars and th- that in my opinion is a great move yeah it was um it was quite the steal um you know you know Calais Campbell one of the one of the top names in the NFL as far as a defender is concerned especially on the on the defensive line um you know he's he's been in the league for 12 years, um, but he's been he's really been a grinder throughout his entire career, and um, you know he's always had great numbers to match up. Um, he just he just hasn't played on very good teams, uh, so I think this was just a great move for the Ravens. They needed some help on the defensive end, especially on the defensive line. Um, you know, especially in that uh, you know you saw it in that Tennessee game in the last game they played in the season. You know, they weren't able to really get pressure. They weren't able to get um, off their blocks very well. Um, so I think Calais Campbell gives them an edge in both those areas now. Um, and this this was just a smart move. You know, Eric DaCosta is the, is the new GM. He's been – I think this is his second or third season he's been there. He hasn't been there very long. He took over for Ozzie Newsom, of course. Um, but, yeah, I, I, I've just been impressed with a lot of the moves he's made. I think – you know, if this could work out, um, it's definitely a big steal for the Ravens. I think a lot of people consider it a steal either way, especially when you consider they just sent a fifth-round pick for him. Um, so, you know, I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, you know, I think they're a Super Bowl contending team, and this could just adds a whole other layer to it and gives them a whole other edge. And that division where you really defense has become so so important in recent years, um, 
this is this is sweet. This is this is a really sweet, uh, really sweet deal. Absolutely, Calais Campbell to the Ravens, a two-year, twenty-seven million dollar deal. Um, I I think it's a decent move. The Ravens will try him out for two years, but I I think this could bolster up the Ravens' defense a lot. Jason, moving on to you. You are a Steelers fan, so you must not like this move when <laughs> the Steelers' offense is facing the Ravens' defense. Um, yeah, I mean, Cam, I mean, he's obviously, I mean, he is what he is. You know, he's one of the top defensive linemen in football. But, you know, you talk about the fit, um, and, I, and I actually think the fit is not a great one as far as him fitting into their defensive scheme in Baltimore, to be honest with you. Um, if, if you kind of look at what he did in Jacksonville, they kind of played more to his strengths, whereas it sounds like Baltimore um, may end up moving him um, you know, kind of kicking him down a little bit more where, where he played when he was in Arizona, which, um, you know, he, he was, he was very good in Arizona, but he was dominant in Jacksonville. Um, you know, he's 34 years old. Um, you know, it's, there's no doubt. I mean, he's good. Uh, and obviously he's going to, he's going to help their defense. Um, yeah. And, and I don't think you can downplay that, but at the same time, um, I don't know. I mean, the, the Baltimore, the Baltimore defense is always stout. So when, when you're talking about, you know, their defensive front four, their defensive front seven, I mean, that's kind of what they're known for. Um, so, you know, they kind of just funnel through guys anyways. Um, so when they made the move, I mean, obviously the Steelers fan, you're like, gosh, just, you know, they're just, they just continue to get these guys and, you know, how do they afford them? But I think this is, this is like the whole key of the NFL nowadays, right? Like Lamar Jackson's on his rookie deal. So they don't have to pay a quarterback. So now they can fork up money for guys like Calais Campbell, guys like Marcus Peters, um, you know, and, and they can kind of bolster that defense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, contract uh, contracts are unique. Um, if you work it out the right way, you could have money, like you just said, for um, to improve other parts of your team. So big move there. Um, the Ravens getting Calais Campbell. Um uh, moving on, staying the AFC, um, not really a trade or anything, but Tennessee is invested in Ryan Tannehill. Contract extension, four years, $118 million total. And the Titans also franchise tagged Derrick Henry. Does this, um, does this mean, um, Jason, that Tennessee um, – they they think Ryan Tannehill can lead them all the way to a Super Bowl, or um, does this mean something different to you in your mind? No, I mean I think that's what it has to mean, right? Because they they were they were mentioned as a potential destination for Tom Brady, but they opted to go with Tannehill, who um, you know he'll be he'll be thirty one at the start of next year, um, but he'll be a very old thirty one. I mean he'll turn thirty two during the season, so. Um, this honestly, you know, there's kind of two ways to look at this with Tannehill. This either reeks of a deal that in two years you're going to look at and you're going to be like, oh my gosh, this, this was just horrific. Or, um, you know, Ryan Tannehill was just really a mediocre quarterback whenever he was um, in Miami because Adam Gates is terrible. Um, and, and obviously, you know, if you're Tennessee, you're in a tight spot because, you know, he wins, he wins two playoff games. Um, against New England and Baltimore and, and gets into the AFC Championship game. And if you don't pay him and he goes somewhere else and, and continues to produce and get you know get his new team to where they're going to be, um, you know, you kind of look foolish for not signing him. So, And I think really based on what Mike Vrabel wants to do in Tennessee, which is really run the football, control the clock, and play defense, uh, it makes a lot of sense to have a guy like Tannehill who can make some things happen with his legs. Um, traditionally he, he takes, you know, pretty good care of the football. I mean, he, he only threw six interceptions last year. Um, granted it was in 10 games, but I mean, he, he's not like a turnover machine. So, I, I mean, I think, I think this deal made a lot of sense for both sides. Um, and I think it was really a deal that Tennessee had to make just based on how they finished the season. Yeah, obviously Tennessee made it deep, and um, they're invested in the long-term future. And Ryan Tannehill knows the system. Um, and it would have been different if they brought somebody else in, like Tom Brady or another veteran like that. But, uh, anyways, uh, moving on to you, Dan. Um, your thoughts on this move? 
Um, I, I agree with Jason. Um, you know, I, I think it, it makes sense. I think the, the money's a bit high for my liking. I think the, um, what is it? 118 million, right? Yeah. For, um, for a total contract, four years, a hundred yeah, million total. Yeah. That, that seems a little high for me, but I mean that the way, if you look at the NFL now, I mean, that's just kind of how quarterbacks, quarterbacks are getting paid like that, that ridiculous amount of money when they don't necessarily when they haven't necessarily won like, you know, a crucial game necessarily like a, uh, like a conference championship or anything like that. Um, I, but I do see Tannehill as more of a, a sort of a game manager. And, and like Jason said, I think that's kind of what Mike Vrabel wants to see. Um, <clears throat> you know, he's not looking for a guy who's going to go out there and throw 50 or 60 touchdowns, you know, 40 or 50 touchdowns in a season uh, because they have Derrick Henry and he can really shoulder the load for a lot of that offense. Um, so I, I, I think it makes sense, but I, like I said, I think, I still think the money is just a little bit too high for my liking. Um, but you, I mean, you made a good point, Josh, you know, he knows the system already. He's, he's played with like, uh, he's played under Mike Vrabel. Um, there's a lot of trust there between quarterback and head coach a lot of times. And, um, you know, that really makes a big difference at the end of the day. So, um, uh, we'll see in a couple of years how this turns out. Um, like I said, I think the money is just a little bit too high for a guy who, you know, played well in the playoffs, but like I said, you know, it, it, it was mostly just how well Derrick Henry played um, and really pulled their offense in those, those couple game those couple playoff games that they really dominated, quite frankly. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, we'll give them a couple of years and see if the uh, Titans want to uh, make, make a move or not and, uh, and go from there. But, He's kind of been, you know, statistically the same sort of quarterback year after year. He's, you know, a 20 touchdown guy usually, um, or, you know, like, you know, like 14 to 20 touchdown guy. And usually in the, in the mid tens, as far as interceptions. So um, that's probably what he's, what he's going to give you the next four years. So um, if they can build a team around Ryan Tannehill, especially on offense, if they can add some more weapons um, outside of just Derrick Henry, they could become a really, really good offense and if they can continue to build that defense which has kind of been underrated i think um then the titans could really make a move in that division and become a team to beat absolutely any way you put this the titans are um moving forward and um i I think there's a good shot they might make it back in the playoffs next season um toss-up question whoever wants to answer it are they going to are they going to keep Derrick Henry after this pe- season or does he want too much money? Well, I think when you're talking the money, Josh, like and th- and we when you look at NFL contracts the way that they're they're put out there, you know, the 118 million is assuming he gets every, you know, incentive that's available to him. Yeah. But if but if you go and look at his actual cap number for the next I mean, this is essentially a 2-year deal for Tennessee. Um he's owed 42 million guaranteed over the next two years um and and after that you know they can essentially cut him um you know and and take about 51 million off the books if they want to so like i think i think what they've done here is it's it's kind of a two-year show me deal with the guaranteed money and then if if you know if he does well for two years they pick up his you know they pick up his third and fourth year um you know, and if he doesn't, they move on with, you know, trying to draft another quarterback. Um, I think they're going to do everything they can to sign Henry long term. And and they've already kind of come out and said, like, hey, we're going to fork the money up for this guy. So I think Derrick Henry is going to be a tight long term. I personally think that's a horrific move. Um, I don't think that paying a running back is, is wise in today's NFL um, economy. I think Dallas is kind of seeing that now because there's no way they're going to be able to pay Dak. Um, they you know, they already <laughs> lost Byron Jones. I mean, it, paying a running back is is crazy in today's NFL. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you're talking, you know, if they give Derrick Henry twenty million dollars a year, I mean, Melvin Gordon just signed for six. I mean, is I mean, I'm not saying that that Melvin Gordon and Derrick Henry are even the same player, but I mean, you're talking about fourteen million dollars that you could put into another couple positions. I mean, it just hamstrings you so bad. And running back is as a position where those guys just don't last very long. I mean, they they just break down. And, I mean, and Derrick Henry. It, it, I mean, he's been productive like the last five games of the year, the last two years. I mean, like eighty yeah. percent of his production. 
I just think it's crazy to pay him that much money, but I think that to your point, I think they're going to. Yes, I think they are going to. They're going to keep him. Yeah. So, um, uh, franchise tag is a good point, and um, what you said about the running backs. Look at the Redskins; they're still running with Adrian Peterson, and you're probably <laughs> yeah. not paying him top dollar. So that that's no a good chance. point there by you. Jason. Well, and the, and the Chiefs just won the Super Bowl with Damian Williams playing running back. He made he made like four million dollars this year. Uh huh. I mean, you they, you don't yeah you don't need it. You just don't need it. Yeah, you can shuffle in uh, a lot of guys. A lot of teams do that. Um, you know, the Chiefs had three or four running backs throughout the season that they would sort of uh, shuffle in and out. So that's a great point, Jason. Running backs just not a position that's attractive anymore as far as the big money contracts are. And and they take a beating as well. That's a good point. You know, a lot of a lot of knee injuries and things of that nature. So yeah, that's that's concerning for me. Um, but I I also agree with Jason. I think they're going to give him the money anyway, uh, just because I think it was really because the postseason he had really that put him over the top. Um, you know, the last the the last few games of the season as well, he played extremely well and really just had had everyone's attention and. You know, sometimes that's really what it's all about. At the end of the day, getting paid is having having all the you know the the accolades and attention at the time. So um, I do think they're going to pay him, and um, you know we'll see if the production can continue. But it's it's just it's just really hard. It's just it's really hard to get to get that sort of production all the time. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, moving on, uh, Jason, you mentioned the Cowboys, so we'll go to the Dallas Cowboys next, placing the franchise tag on Dak Prescott. Hey, we all know Jerry Jones has a boatload of money. Is he going to fork it out for Dak Prescott next season? I don't know if they're going to be able to, Josh. I mean, they're, the, the Cowboys are really getting up against the cap here. And, I mean, if if they – if they are going to pay Dak Prescott, I mean, they're going to have, I saw a number. I mean, they're going to have like an outlandish amount of their cap basically sunk into Dak, Amari Cooper, and Zeke Elliott. But, I mean, they've kind of put themselves in this position because you 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 got to have a franchise quarterback to win in the NFL. I mean, that, that's just, yeah, that's just where it is. Um and and I think what they've done is they said you know we're gonna we're gonna surround Dak with the right people, which which is great, but I mean Amari's gonna be owed a ton of money, Zeke's gonna be owed a ton of money. I mean Zeke's contract is is about to get crazy on them. Um, I mean here here is here is Zeke's cap numbers after this year: thirteen point seven million, sixteen point five million, fifteen million, twelve point six million, fifteen point four million, sixteen point six million. I mean. He's getting paid like a like a superstar cornerback would get paid. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, and you know, I just I don't know where they're going to find the money, and and they will because they'll work it out. But they're just they're just going to be so bad in so many other areas. Um, probably on the defensive side of the football. Yeah, that's what I was about to um, say. <laughs> yeah, I mean they're they're going to be really bad on the defensive side of the football, and um, you know, with Dak. You know, saying that he wants forty million a year. I, I mean, oh. it, it's just hard to win in the NFL when when your quarterback is taking up a fifth of your salary cap. I yeah, that's abs- not how teams can win. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've seen that salary cap issue with the Redskins. They ran into cap trouble and they lost most of their draft picks. But year after year, yep. Dallas is in for a tough ride, in my opinion. Um, I don't know if you all agree with me, but they already lost Byron Jones to the Dolphins, making him the highest paid cornerback in the league. They lost Randall Cobb to the Texans on a three-year, $27 million deal. So Dallas, I, I, I think they're... I think the sirens going off, like there might be some trouble going on in Dallas here in the next couple of months, trying to sort out their money issues. Um, th- this is my take on Dallas, and this is why I think that they franchise Dak. I think they're going to see what happens this year, and if you see them go eight and eight, nine and seven, and he doesn't have an extension in place by then, they're going to cut him loose and try to find a QB in the draft because that's going to be their only chance to build a competitive team. Now. If they make a deep run, 
good for them. Jerry Jones is happy because they make a deep run, maybe get to the Super Bowl, and then they have to pay him. But but I think the franchise tag is going to work for them this year. And then if they, you know, if they sputter out in the wild card game, I I, I look for them to move on after this year. I don't I I don't think. And really, if I'm if I'm them, I don't think Dak Prescott can win a Super Bowl. I wouldn't pay him forty million. Yeah. So um, my next point. Dallas just um, got a new head coach in Mike McCarthy, former Packers head coach. Do you think the chemistry between Dak Prescott and Mike McCarthy will fit well together? Uh, I think that's too early to tell, to be honest. Um, you know, we haven't haven't even really gotten to the you know the summer months yet of really what when you start to see that sort of thing unfold. So um, I really have no idea if they're going to be able to mesh. Um, you know, there there were points, especially towards the end of Mike McCarthy's tenure in, in Green Bay, where he and Aaron Rodgers clashed a lot. Um, I think Rodgers and Prescott have pretty different personalities. Um, at least, you know, it kind of seems that way. I think Dak's a little bit more laid back than Rodgers is. Um, but I, I don't know if they can make it work. Um, it's always it's always tough when you have a first-year head coach. Um well, he, I mean, he's not a first-year head coach, but you know what I mean—a a new head coach, yeah, yeah, trying to mesh, trying to mesh with a quarterback who's who's been in the league for um, for now four years. So we'll see what happens. Um, I I think I could see it work. Honestly, I think they have similar sort of attitudes about it, but honestly, it's just way too early to tell. There's 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 no sample size there yet. So um, I I think it could work, but. You know, it could also be one of those things where it's just like a like a like an explosion. So, <laughs> you know, they really could go either way. Absolutely. So, uh, let's move on here to a couple quick um, moves before we dive into some more serious moves. So, uh, number one, the Falcons released Devontae Freeman. This was definitely coming. Devontae Freeman was underperforming all the time for Atlanta, in my opinion. And I think they made the right move. The Browns signed Austin Hooper. The Packers signed Christian Kirksey to a two-year $16 million deal. The Browns signed former Redskin Case Keenum to a three-year $18 million deal. The Giants bolster their defense with linebacker Blake Martinez with a three-year $30 million deal. A deal dollar deal excuse me i cannot speak tonight but gentlemen any thoughts about um any of those moves i think christian kirksey i th- i think that's a lot of money for him <clears throat> um that's just my opinion um i think he's an okay you know um i think he's i think he's okay but i don't know it just just seems like a lot of money i mean he started with the browns and maybe he wasn't he probably overperformed on that team just because it's the Browns, let's be honest. Um, but that just seems like a lot of money for me. But they definitely need help on defense. Um, so I, I, I could see that working. I mean, the Packers need a lot of help on defense. Um, so we'll see if that works out. It's just, you know, $18 million a year is kind of is kind of, uh, it's kind of steep. That's just my opinion. Absolutely. And Jason, your thoughts? Uh, I'd say the most underrated signing that you mentioned out of all those is Case Keenum to Cleveland. Um, <laughs> I mean, honestly, because I think that I think Baker is going to be pushed a little bit, which I think Baker needs to be pushed a little bit. But I think that could be good for everybody in the Cleveland offense. Um, I, I think Austin Hooper might be a little bit of a trap next year, um, just looking at the fantasy side of things. Now, that said, you know when you're when you're talking Browns and we we kind of mentioned this last year um whenever I was talking to you early in the year about you know Browns players for fantasy purposes and I said you know everybody wants to draft the Browns you know super high super high super high and I said be careful because if you're going to get these guys at their at their asking price you know you're probably getting a you know top five percent outcome for these guys um but Kevin Stefanski who's their new head coach he ran uh, more two tight end sets than any offensive coordinator in football last year in Minnesota. So you're going to see Hooper and Njoku on the field a lot together, um, which if you look at the personnel grouping in Cleveland, you're probably talking Odell, uh, Jarvis Landry, Njoku, Hooper, and Chubb as being the, the most talented players on that offense. So it makes sense to get them on the field together. Um, I, I just don't see Hooper replicating anything close to what he did in Atlanta um, last year. 
So, you know, while it's probably a solid signing, I, I don't think it's like an earth shattering thing, but I think Keenum is going to be a very, very, very good thing for, for Baker Mayfield this year. Um, I, I think Baker is going to bounce back uh, in a big way. Um, I think he learned a lot from last year and I think he's just legitimately good. Um, and I think Keenum will be a good presence there for him. So I, I think of all those signings, Keenum is probably the most underrated one. Absolutely. I, I I agree with that as well, Jason. So another move I forgot to point out um, earlier, the Raiders signed Marcus Marietta. What does this mean for Derek Carr in um, his offense in the brand new Las Vegas Raiders? It means they're getting tired of him. They're, they're trying to, trying to find some solutions now um, to possibly possibly replace him. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's going to happen now or if it happens some, at some point during the season. I wouldn't be surprised if it does happen during the season if, if we see some Marcus Mariota action. Because um, I think John Gruden has really, has really tried. I mean, when he first got there to, to the Raiders, he really tried to work with Derek Carr, and, and he really liked Derek Carr. But you can see the frustration building with the team, and I, I think this is a good move. You get a guy who, you know, is 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 a decent quarterback. Um, he's had his he's had his ups and downs. Um, you know, this is kind of similar to the, to the Baker Mayfield thing, where he kind of applies pressure on Derek Carr to either step up or or shut up or get out of line. So, um, I think I think it's a good move for the Raiders. Absolutely. So, um, moving on here, um, Jason, pick a uh, um. Yeah, one of two choices, left or right. Well, I'm a lefty, so we're gonna get left. Left. Yeah. All right, that's where we're moving to next. Um, probably one of the worst moves in free agency. I I just couldn't decide what we were talking about next. One of the absolute worst moves. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you can't agree with me on this, I mean. Yeah, I, I respect your opinion, but I'm not sure why. The Houston Texans traded one of their best wide receivers in DeAndre Hopkins to Arizona for, for a couple a couple draft picks and David Johnson. I I mean I I really don't get the logic behind why they traded away DeAndre Hopkins. So I've tried to look at this from every angle possible to to try to figure out what they're thinking here. Um, Well, and, you know, because the thing about getting David Johnson is, like, his contract is is not good. I mean, like, he's owed a ton of money, too. Um, And I think he's just completely washed. Absolutely. And, yeah, so they don't have any draft picks. I mean, they they have traded away – I mean, they've traded away, like, their first-round pick from, like, now until, you know, COVID-19 will be completely wiped away, which will be, like, 10 years from now. So, (laughs) I mean, they – so they got dangled a second-round pick, and I think they panicked, and I think Bill O'Brien thought, yeah, you know. And the other part of this is, um, you know, Hopkins wanted a new contract, and he wanted to be paid Amari Cooper money, and – I don't think Houston wanted to pay him Amari Cooper money because Amari Cooper is going to make $22 million a year beginning next year. And I think um, Bill O'Brien thought, no, we're not going to pay you that. Um, you know, we're already, we're already, you know, on the books um, for you enough. And I think he just decided, you know, we're going to move on from this. I know there was some stuff that they talked about maybe internally uh, between him and between him and Hopkins, but I think at the end of the day, he just felt like getting a second round pick plus a, what he probably considers as a bell cow running back. Um, you know, and I really think that he just believes that Deshaun Watson can win games without, without Hawkins, um, which is not true. And I love Deshaun Watson, but DeAndre Hopkins is one of the three best wide receivers in football. Absolutely. Um, you know, I just, I don't, I don't get it. Nobody I've talked to in the industry gets it. Um, you know, but, that's why, that's why Houston is just going to perennially be a team that you know gets beat in the wild card round on the Saturday game at four o'clock. I mean, that's going to be who they are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know what you mean there because like they're always in the wild card game on Saturday. But every year, I, almost from yeah, what I've year. seen. 
Yeah, but anyways, um, uh, I'm glad I'm not the only one here. Um, I mean, the Cardinals just got Hopkins at a steal, and Kyler yeah. Murray has weapons to throw to. Larry Fitzgerald's still there. Don't count Larry out because he he still can produce some, and they have one of the best in DeAndre Hopkins. Um, Dan, how will this help Kyler Murray become a better quarterback? Well, this is exactly what you need when you have a young quarterback. You have to surround them with weapons. Um, and you saw some really good flashes last year of what Kyler can do um, just with what he had last year, which really was not very much outside of Larry Fitzgerald. <clears throat> Excuse me, outside of Larry Fitzgerald. Um, so th- this is really going to take his play to, to the whole next level. And I, I'm i not going to say he's going to have an MVP caliber season, um, but you know I think he could get pretty close next year with, with – right now with what he has um they just got to shore up that offensive line they had a lot of issues last year with Tyler getting hit a lot and um really just trying to run for his life a lot of times he got to show off his speed in that situation in those situations but um he really got he got hit too he got hit too often so um I think I think right now they like you said they have the weapons I mean I that that um connection with DeAndre Hopkins is just going to be nasty and I'm look, looking forward to seeing that and I'm sure the the fantasy picks are going to be hot with um with those two guys so I'm excited to see what see what he can do um I think he showed a lot of promise last year just on just simply a bad football team so um I don't know if the Cardinals are going to be you know a 12 and 4 team I I still think they have a ton of issues especially on the defensive side of the ball um but I, I think certainly they can improve a lot in a lot of areas, especially on offense, and they can be a force to be reckoned with week in and week out with these two guys. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that. So um, moving on, um, the next topic I want to talk about, um, it was really a surprise to me, maybe not to you all, but Tom Brady signing – with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers after 20 incredible years with the New England Patriots. Don't get me wrong. Tom Brady will be a first ballot Hall of Famer, in my opinion. But going to the Buccaneers, I feel like this is going to work out one of two ways for Tom Brady. Bruce Arians and the Buccaneers will give Tom Brady the system. Um, They will work the system around Tom Brady and Tom Brady will be a leader for that team and help the Buccaneers grow, and they're going to win a lot of games. Or it could happen like this. The Buccaneers can throw Tom Brady in their system and say, hey, Tom, win us a Super Bowl, and that will be the end of Tom Brady. Um, uh, Any way you put it, I, I mean, I just really don't understand this move like why Tampa Bay I know you want to change and you want money 30 million dollars a year on a two-year contract but I mean I I feel like this could end really really badly for Tom Brady starting with you Jason I know you probably hate the Patriots since the Steelers and the Patriots (laughs) have clashed before in a lot of close games, but give me your thoughts on this move. Um, so just starting with the, uh, let's start with the Patriots side of things. I, I don't think this is necessarily like the end of the Patriots. Um, they're, they're going to, they're going to get a quarterback and, and I, and I really think they're probably going to be okay. I, I don't think this is the end of the Patriots. I mean, the Patriots play in the worst division of football. Um, so they're going to have the Dolphins and the Jets and the Bills still six times a year. So this is not the end of the Patriots. Um, although, I mean, I did like to see the fact that Tom Brady was leaving. I, I think as far as him going to Tampa, um, I mean, Tampa's offense is kind of everything New England's is it from a personnel standpoint. Um, you know, Mike Evans, uh, Chris Godwin, who I think has a chance to be the best wide receiver in football. Um he's going to have two guys at receiver that that are as good as probably he's ever had outside of Randy Moss. So 
Um, and I think when he looked at this, I think he kind of looked at between what Bruce Arians has done with some quarterbacks like um, Carson Palmer in the past, uh, and even what he squeezed out of Jameis. I mean, Jameis threw 30 interceptions last year, but he also threw 35 touchdowns. Um, I think the question with, with Tom Brady, as far as just a production standpoint, is, you know, the, the Bucks were forced to throw a lot last year because they were behind because Jameis was turning it over so much. Um, if if Tom Brady does what he normally does, which is take care of the football, uh, maybe they won't be forced to throw as much. So you could see a guy like Ronald Jones, and I would assume they're going to draft a running back, um, become increasingly valuable on that side of things. Um, but you look at you look at the uh, NFC South, and it's, you know, the, the Saints are there. And I think the Saints from, from top to bottom, as far as the roster goes, is probably the most complete team in football right now. Um, but, you know, I think Tom Brady looked at Tampa Bay as just an opportunity to, to kind of go somewhere. And, and, and I, he's just so calculated. I don't think he would have went there if he didn't think he could win. And when you look at QB salaries, I mean, I don't think $30 million is is out of bounds for him. Um I mean, th- this is a list of guys making at least $30 million a year. Russell Wilson, Ben Roethlisberger, Aaron Rodgers, Jared Goff, Kirk Cousins, Carson <laughs> Wentz, Zach Prescott, Matt Ryan, and Ryan Tannehill. Um, on that list, I mean, how many guys would you want over Tom Brady, honestly? I mean, let's just go down. Would you rather have Ryan Tannehill or Tom Brady? Tom Brady. Matt Ryan or Tom Brady? Tom Brady. Zach Prescott or Tom Brady? Tom Brady. Carson Wentz or Tom Brady? Uh, I like Wentz, but I'll go with Brady. Okay. Kirk Cousins <laughs> or Tom Brady? Oh, definitely Tom Brady. Jared Goff or Tom Brady? <laughs> the list goes on and on. Tom Brady. I mean, and then you got Rodgers, Roethlisberger, and Wilson at the top, and I, and I would take all three of them over Tom Brady with, Ross, with Roethlisberger being probably the, the closest one, but I think Rodgers and Wilson are better than Brady at this point. But, I mean, you know, I don't think the contract is, is out of bounds. And again, if you're talking about guaranteed money, I mean, Tom Brady's only making $25 million a year. I mean, Derek Carr is going to make more than he is. Uh, Matt Stafford's going to make more than he is. Jacoby Brissett is going to make more than he is. I, I think the contract's fine. I don't think the contract's a problem at all because you've got to pay a top-tier quarterback money. Uh-huh, and Jameis yeah, wasn't going to get them where they need to be. So I'm fine with the contract. And I, I think it's a pretty good fit. I think it's hilarious how Jameis Winston got his eyesight fixed, then immediately he gets replaced by <laughs> a veteran who spent 20 years in New England, has a handful of Super Bowl rings, maybe even two. And I, I, I just feel like it's hilarious how Jameis just gets replaced. But I, I love the fact Jameis is out of Tampa Bay. I absolutely hate Jameis Winston. Any way you put it, he's a terrible person and a terrible athlete. So, I mean, yeah, Tom, yeah, he's, his his character is not very good either. That is true. Yeah, a- absolutely. But I mean, um, Tom Josh, Brady. Wait till he goes to New England and and goes twelve and four. <laughs> oh, that'd be hilarious. That would be hilarious. <laughs> that would be such a that would be such a great payback, though. Honestly, that'd be <laughs> unbelievable. It might happen. You can't, oh you can't put it past Belichick, man. He, Belichick's able to just pull the pull the most out of players that you've never heard of before. So yeah, and Jason, you were talking about you were talking about New England and how they're not done. I mean, they they're gonna go through a little bit of a low, but you know, you got Belichick, you got Robert Kraft running the team. No, they're not putting up with any crap. They're gonna put the players they find best onto the field and they're going to win football games. I'm not sure if they'll be racing straight to the top next year, but they'll get there again. I mean, the dynasty has changed, but is it over? I agree with you. I don't think so. I mean, they're they're hey. best, probably no. the third best team in the AFC. I mean, at best, the third best team behind Kansas City and Baltimore. Um, but I mean, I don't know. I just with Belichick and what they have going on there. I mean, you, you know they're going to win ten games. I mean, they always do. I and now they get to play underdog, so I think that gives you know lights even more of a fire under Belichick and his mm-hmm. team. So yeah. um and that and that's honestly more scary than the Patriots, who everyone expected them to be in the Super Bowl anyway. So yeah, I, I think I think those are all good points. I think they could uh, surprise a lot of people next year. Yeah, so uh, let, let's let continue. Um, I want to sort of segue here. 
um, staying in Tom Brady's division, Drew Brees um, signed a contract extension to stay with the Saints two years, $50 million. And um, the reason why I'm sort of tying this in with the Buccaneers and Tom Brady is that Drew Brees and Tom Brady will be facing twice a year. Yeah, I mean, and that division just just got better with obviously with Brady going to Tampa Bay. But when I mean, when you're looking at New Orleans right now, I mean, easily to me, the most complete team in at least the NFC and probably in football. I mean, I, I would say the Ravens are close. Um, but I mean, not only did they sign Breeze, but they also went out and got Emmanuel Sanders. Yeah. Um, you know, and Mike Thomas just has dominated targets for so long in that offense the last two years. I mean, he, he's just doubling up the next closest guy on targets. Um, they've never, they haven't really had like a, a solid number two behind him. Uh, and I mean, Emmanuel Sanders is going to catch a ton of balls and he kind of fits right with what Drew Brees likes to do, which is throw underneath. So, I mean, th- this is a very, very good football team um, in New Orleans right now. And, you know, again, just like with most things, they sign Breeze for two years, they're going to make a run at it, and if it doesn't work out, they're going to start over. Um, but that's kind of where their roster's at right now. And they've got some young talent with Michael Thomas, and they've got, you know, Alan Kamara, and they've now got Emmanuel Sanders. I mean, they've got the pieces to make a run, and I feel like they really thought they missed their chance last year. So, yeah, I mean, I, I like this. I mean, you got to bring back a guy like Drew Brees when I mean, you have to. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I do like the Sanders signing as well. It was um really good. I'm not sure. Let me find the numbers there. Emmanuel Sanders, two years, $16 million with the Saints. So um, I-, I couldn't agree with you more, Jason. They're a complete football team. And this division has really changed because from the Saints, Teddy Bridgewater finally gets to make uh, starting role after um, being injured with the Vikings for so long. He played with the Saints some um, with Drew Brees being injured. Now Teddy Bridgewater gets a chance to help the Panthers win some football games. As you know, the Panthers have made a lot of changes. Um, they released Cam Newton. That was drama. And they're like, we've requested Cam Newton, he can find a trade, and he apparently said that didn't happen. And Kyle Allen gets shipped off to Washington. So there is a lot of change moving around in this division of football. Yeah. Uh, just talk about Teddy Bridgewater for a minute. The Kyle Allen trade for the Panthers was straight robbery. They got a fifth, fifth round pick for Kyle Allen. I mean, that's, man, that's, that's a good Back deal. They were able to get part. something that high, yeah. Well, anything. Yeah, I mean, so they get a fifth-round pick from Washington, which has surprised nobody on this pod. Um, <laughs> you know, because they just give stuff away. But, you know, Teddy going to Carolina, I'm not sure why they were so eager to get rid of Cam unless they just didn't believe in his health, which, I mean, this tells me they didn't, considering what Teddy Bridgewater went through to get back. Um, you know, and, and I think – uh, you know, Carolina also just signed Robbie Anderson, which which kind of was a weird fit for them because they already had Curtis Samuel and DJ Moore. Um, I mean, it's not like Teddy Bridgewater is not going to have a lack of weapons uh, in Carolina between Christian McCaffrey, Anderson Moore, and, and Curtis Samuel, and, and Ian Thomas, who's a really underrated tight end for them. Um, so, you know, there, there's going to be some some weapons there. I just I just don't think that Carolina – the firepower to keep up with with these other teams i mean i just i don't think that they can come out of the box and score 35 points um on a consistent basis and you know their defense is taking a couple hits losing james bradbury to the giants and and luke keekley retiring and i just you know i think carolina is going to be the worst team in that division um next year you know even despite the fact that they that they had brought in teddy bridgewater i just i just don't think they're going to be much better next year than they were this year However you put it, I still like the move for Teddy Bridgewater after all he's been through. He finally he deserves it. starting spot. He does deserve it. Well, when, when he's had to step in, he's played well, and um, he's really exceeded expectations a lot of times, but he's never really had a um, really a full season to get acclimated and to start really in this league. He's always been sort of a, 
I think sort of been on the back burner, been an afterthought. But, you know, sometimes doing the whole journeyman thing in the NFL and sort of being a backup and no one's talking about you, you're not the headline. You know, it it works out for some players. And, you know, for him, I'm really happy for him. And I hope uh, hope it all works out. Obviously, I, I agree with Jason. I think I think the Panthers are rebuilding now. And it's it's going to be a tough year for them. Um, I think they're a five-win team. So it's it's going to be a long season. Um, you know, their fans just have to hang in there and, um, you know, surround – they have to surround Teddy Bridgewater with some weapons, and we'll see where he is in a couple years. Yeah, I also want to piggyback off of um, Jason's point where you said uh, Kyle Allen, um, it was sort of robbery. Um but Kyle Allen was in Ron Rivera's system. So this could be a learning opportunity for him with Washington, but the Redskins didn't decide to sign, sign Cam Newton or another big veteran. And that goes to show that Washington wants to keep Dwayne Haskins, in my opinion, and not just throw him out of the starting position. Well, and I mean, Washington still has Allen on the books for an insane amount of money um, for the next three years. I mean, his cap number the next three years, I mean, 21-4, 24-4, 26-4. Um, That's ridiculous. Now, they, wow. they can cut him. Well, they can cut him after this year. Um, if they cut him this year, they've got about $32 million in dead money on their books, which they're not going to want. So they're going to hang on to him after, for this year. But they can cut him after this year and um, – you know the dead money hit is not is not too bad. Actually, the cap savings is worth much more than the, than the dead money that's going to be tied up in his contract, which they'll probably eat that um, unless they can find someone to take him off their hands. But I, I mean, I think Washington's kind of. I mean, they're just kind of in limbo at the quarterback position. Um, I mean, they they just they can't bring in someone like Cam when you're already tying up that much money. With mm-hmm. um, you know, you just can't do it. So, uh, you know, I, bringing in Kyle Allen to me is just insurance in case Haskins isn't very good and Alex Smith isn't healthy enough to play. Yeah, I mean, who else yeah, does Washington it's have? Because it's so strange. He, yeah, who else does Washington have? Because they shipped off Colt McCoy to the Giants, and um, I think it's only Dwayne Haskins and Kyle Allen. Well, now I'm Alex, Alex Smith. Oh, yeah, yeah, when he gets healthy. Right, 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 right. But yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. I, I think that getting Kyle Allen was essentially insurance in the event that Haskins isn't very good and Smith isn't healthy. Yeah, that that's yeah. what. And I think they thought it was worth a fifth round pick to do it, which is good for them. But uh, Washington, I mean, they're just not they're just not going anywhere. They don't make I'm sorry. smart moves. They don't make smart they're, moves. I know. They're they're still a mess. They're they're just an, an absolute mess. Um, even with all the firings and hirings they did in the off season. You know, this this just doesn't make sense to me. I don't I don't know why they traded for Kyle Allen, so whatever. Um I've questioned just about every move the Redskins have made the last ten years. And that's not gonna change anytime soon, I don't think. So sorry to tell you, Josh. But um yeah. yeah uh, I, I, I really I, I really don't get it. I thought you know, I I thought they'd go and maybe draft somebody if they were looking for for um, you know, a quarterback who could maybe help them out. Maybe not a first probably not a first round pick, but probably later on, like a mid round. Um, draft choice to try to help them out, but it is it is what it is. You know, it's it's still the Redskins after all. So, um, yeah, it's it's definitely a confusing deal for me. Um, but I I think they're trying to they're sort of committing to Dwayne Haskins, and sort of not with this deal though. And uh, you know, I I think we'll see this year if it affects his psyche in a way that he knows. You know, there's who knows how many quarterbacks they're going to have on the roster. The start of the season they could have three i guess the most um most teams usually only have two but um you know maybe it, it maybe it messes with him and he he doesn't play as well or maybe he steps up but um i don't know i'm I'm still not sold on Dwayne haskins either way so um this this year is definitely a telling year the sophomore season for an nfl quarterback it goes a long way and showing what they can do long term Josh, you should be you should be rooting for the Redskins to go one and fifteen and get the number one pick next year and take Trevor Lawrence. That that is the <laughs> and that's the perfect scenario because if you look at if you look at their salary cap situation, next year 
they've got a ton of cap space. And if they clear Alex Smith off the books, they have even more cap space. Now, the problem, of course, is Dan Snyder doesn't know how to sign free agents, but they'll, ha- <laughs> they'll have the money to do it. And if they get that number one pick and they do tank for Trevor Lawrence, I mean, then you, then you're talking because you're talking about potentially having your franchise quarterback on a rookie, on a rookie contract. So, I mean, honestly, Josh, and, and you hate to see it, but if I'm you, I'm rooting for them to go 0 and 16 and get the number one pick. I mean, that's just, that's it. You're either, you're either winning a Super Bowl or you're trying to get the number one pick as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And we're not winning a Super Bowl. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm still HTTR till you die, but I mean, it's just hard to keep the faith sometimes. All right, moving on. Um, let's talk um, another trade move. Um, I think the Vikings sort of got fed up with Stefan Diggs in some of his comments, and they traded him to the Bills. Um, I liked Stefan Diggs. I think he was a good fit for Minnesota, but I think this goes to show that Minnesota doesn't deal with anybody talking bad or um, uh, talking down to the team, and they want to keep the chemistry up in the locker room. Um, yeah, and they, I'm going to tell you, man, they got a ton. Um, they got a ton for Stefan Diggs. I mean, they, they got a first-round pick for him, which when you consider what the Texans got for Hopkins makes that deal look even worse. But, um <laughs> I mean, they got a bunch for Stephon Diggs, and really, Minnesota is just, I mean, they're a run-first offense. I mean, they want to give Dalvin Cook the ball 25 times a game and, and control the clock and play defense. I mean, that's what that's what they want to do. So, uh, you know, that Stephon Diggs last year, I mean, he only had 94 targets. Um, I mean, caught 67 balls. I mean, you know, I think, and they thought, you know, we can probably replace his production with two or three other guys. So, you know, you trade him, you trade him away, you, you get, a, I think, a one, a four, and a five, maybe, and and you move on. Which I, I like the deal for Minnesota. I like for Buffalo. I mean, I think both sides got what they needed here. Buffalo gets their number one wide receiver, and Minnesota gets the picks. So, uh, good deal, in my opinion. Dan, your thoughts? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think this is great. Uh, I agree with Jason. With um, both sides, kind of win. And especially Josh Allen, I mean, he finally gets, you know, a, a number one receiver here. And, um, you know, he was quoted as saying he's floating on cloud nine after this trade. So I'm excited to see what he can do with um, with with Stephon Diggs because he really hasn't had much to work with. <laughs> um, he's really kind of had no-name receivers or guys who were kind of bounced around the league um, his first two years in the NFL. So. I'm excited to see what he can do um, with Stephon Diggs. I, I I think the Bills' offense is definitely they're definitely improving. Um, I don't, you know I don't know if they're um, if they're the team in that division now to to go up against, but I, I certainly think that um, that Josh Allen becomes a lot better quarterback. I think he I think he improves his numbers by a lot, and he really makes the Bills a decent contender for that division at the end of the season. Um, and and that's that's all well and dandy. And then like, just like what Jason said, I, I think the Vikings, the Vikings can definitely, you know, they already have Alan, Adam Thielen and, you know, several, several other receivers um, around them, around their, their guys, you know, they don't, they didn't need Stephon Diggs as much as they needed him, you know, this past year that they needed him in, you know, t- uh, 2018 or 2017. So um, I think it's a good move across the board. I think both sides get what they want and um, yeah, you get, you get a first round pick. I mean, that's, that's unbelievable. That's, that's really good. Especially like, like with Jason said, when you compare it to the, uh, the DeAndre Hopkins move. So, um, win, win for everybody and, and both teams get to, you know, get, get even better, I think. Yeah. And, uh, Stefan Diggs, if you, um, don't remember, he actually sent the Vikings to the NFC championship game with the Minneapolis miracle. So, um, it, it was a yep. great squad there, um, with Adam Thielen and Stefan Diggs, a lot of weapons Kirk Cousins could throw to, but Jason's absolutely right. When he said they want to give Dolvin cook the ball 25 times a game. And, um, J- Jason, he, um, 
said to me earlier um, in the year, uh, yeah, you don't want to pick up Dalvin Cook. You want to trade him. And I, I was on the edge in my fantasy league. Do I want to trade him? But I got to the semifinals. I was very proud of myself. But then Dalvin Cook got hurt. So, <laughs> Had him too, Josh. Had him too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You had him too. So, uh, you it, can't you know. always be right, you know. Absolutely. We, we him, tried and, him and Lamar Jackson was riding the wave, and then woof. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, we turned to Jason for fantasy football advice, um, to just to try to get our teams to win a championship. But uh, I fell just short. But nonetheless, Jason Cam Lasky. Kamlowski, great fantasy football advice. So let's move on here, gentlemen. Um, let's talk more quarterbacks. Um, Philip Rivers, the Colts signed Philip Rivers for a one year, $25 million deal. Uh, $25 million, I think it's a little too high for. Uh, yeah. I, I think Philip yeah. Rivers is washed up, in my opinion. I'm not sure what he's going to do for the Indianapolis Colts. I think the Colts are going to draft somebody, draft a quarterback in this year's draft, and Philip Rivers is going to teach him. But I think this is just a one and done, and then Philip Rivers retires. Uh, Jason, um, I I think you'll agree with me here, but what are your thoughts on Philip Rivers? I, mean, I think compared to what they had last year, I mean, they, they didn't really have a a set quarterback in Indianapolis last year. And I, I think it's like anything else, you know, they, they see a division where, um, you know, obviously the Texans have traded away their best player. Um, you know, the Titans, I think, I think Indianapolis looks at the Titans and thinks, you know, they caught lightning in a bottle last year. Um, and obviously the Jaguars have, have just basically given away anybody relevant on their team. So I think the Colts think that they're basically a quarterback away from making a run in the playoffs because, um, you know, really outside of a strong quarterback last year, I mean, you got Marlon Mack back, you've got T.Y. Hilton back. Um, you know, they need some more offensive weapons. It'd be nice for them to get a solid wide receiver too. Um, but I, I think they believe that, you know, signing Phil Rivers is, is going to give them a chance to be competitive. Um, you know, and he, he can kind of be that guy for a bridge year. And then beyond that, we will, uh, you know, we'll kind of see where it goes. Um, you know, and again, it's like anything else. When you're in a situation like Indianapolis is in with their roster, you know, and, and they're, and they don't have, they don't have a high enough pick to either go after Burrow or Tua without giving up so much draft capital that it's going to set them back. Um, you know, I think this is the easy short-term fix. And, I mean, Indianapolis just has so much cap money to throw around anyways. Um, you know, they I think they had the the most cap space of any team in football besides Cincinnati um, going into the offseason. So, I mean, they've got the money to spend, so why not spend it on a guy like Rivers for a year, you know, and kind of see where he goes. Uh, and then, you know, if it doesn't work out, you try to draft your guy, you know, next year or the year after. Yeah, uh, good good points there. Um, I, I think Philip Rivers, as I said earlier, is just going to be a teacher for somebody young. Um, who knows how it will go, but um, I think it's going to be interesting to see how that works with the Indianapolis Colts. So m- moving on, gentlemen, um, some quick notes, um, not the most lot to talk about, but We'll go over them. The Raiders signed tight end Jason Witten. He is continuing his play in the NFL. The Chargers signed Brian Bulaga from Green Bay, three years, $30 million. The Rams um, re-signed Andrew Whitworth to a three-year contract. Joe Flacco fails his um, physical, and he gets cut by the Denver Broncos. As I said earlier, the Giants signed quarterback Colt McCoy, and the Cowboys signed Ha Ha Clinton Dix for a one-year deal. Jason, um, any of these um, stand out to you from the list I just went down? Uh, I think I think the Raiders signing Witten and Marcus Mariota, I think they are kind of hoping that um, people are going to walk out of the casino and think that it is still 2014 and Witten is catching passes for the Cowboys 
and Mariota's competing for a Heisman Trophy from Oregon, and that's how they're going to sell tickets. So um, I, I think that's why they made that move, to be honest with you. Yeah, um, Raiders, they're trying to make something happen here. Um, Jason Witten, he is getting old, so who knows how long he wants to stay in the NFL for, but um, we'll just have to see where that leads. There's a lot to talk about. Um, the Dolphins, um, I believe they're trying to make a move to be the better team than they were. Um, Brian Flores, as you know, um, last year in his first year, he um, wasn't uh, – I mean, they weren't the best team. Um, uh, they were down there at the bottom. But w- with the signing of Jordan Howard – and um, Byron Jones being the um, highest paid quarterback in the NFL. Um, I, I think the Dolphins are trying to make some big moves. What do you think, Jason? Well, they're another team with the cap space to make this happen. And now with signing, um, you know, Byron Jones and also having, um, you know, Xavier Howard. I mean, that, they, they have two of the top corners in football. Um, how much better they'll be, I don't know. Um, I think it would be interesting if they were able to draft Tua. Uh, that would obviously make things a little bit more fun down there because they, they do have some pieces in that offense. Um, you know, Devontae Parker, Albert Wilson, Mike Isecki. So, I mean, it's, it's not like they are um, you know, completely bare. I, I don't think that they're going to be a playoff contender, but they, they played hard for Brian Flores down the stretch. Um, I mean, that, that was a team really that was dead in the water, and they really played hard for him. So, you know, I I think they have the potential. I I think he's kind of in a good spot where, you know, if they do get to a, and they kind of have this gradual uptick, um, you know, and they're able to make the right signings and and put together a couple good draft class, you can see the Dolphins, you know, be a a, a playoff contender probably uh, within two to three years. Um, So, so I kind of like the trajectory that the Dolphins are on. I mean, not necessarily for 2020, but, but beyond that, um, you know, you kind of got to like what they're doing. Uh, and again, you know, that division is not great. So, you know, if, if they can manage to get some things worked out and find their quarterback, I mean, you, we could be talking about a, um, you know, a solid team. Yeah, a- absolutely. And I, I, I mean, the Dolphins, um, as you said, I mean, they beat the Eagles down the stretch, which, which was a huge, um, victory for them but they're moving in the right direction they just need more pieces to the puzzle fitting into the puzzle but i think with the way this afc east is working out now with the patriots losing tom brady there's more room for the dolphins to improve and i i I don't know if you get what i mean by that but i mean i think the dolphins have more of a chance to be better in that division without tom brady and the patriots holding them back if you know what i mean well sure i mean it's it's kind of the same way um you know when you look at i mean and this we're we're gonna go back a couple years but um you know when you look at like the the 49ers from from back in the late eighties, you know, when Montana kind of got out of town and then they replaced him with Steve Young and um but they weren't they weren't the dominant team that they were in the eighties with Joe Montana. Um and, and anytime you see like these iconic quarterbacks leave, I think these these franchises are like, ooh, now's now's our chance. And um and I think the Dolphins think, you know, if they do get to a in the draft, which honestly, I mean, every everything points to them getting to it right now. But a lot, yeah, I think draft so too. Yeah, and I mean, somebody could jump up there and grab him. Uh, they could trade into that spot, but I, I think a lot, um, you know, they they think that they can get him and and potentially be that team. Um, but that's what these franchises look at. You know, they they're not looking at next year. They're looking at, you know three, four years down the road. That's that's what Miami is looking at. They're not looking to win in 2020. They're looking to win in 2024. Yeah, a- absolutely. And um, I, I think it's going up from here for Miami. So um, moving on, um, Titans bolstering their defense with Vic Beasley. Um, your thoughts on that, Dan? Uh, yeah, Vic, Vic Beasley's a solid player. Um, he's a guy who 
you know, he's not a not a superstar necessarily at that position, but he, he's just one of those guys who gives you 110% every time. So I, I, I think it's a good move for them. They needed some help at that position. Um, so, you know, I, I think overall it's, it's a good move for them. And, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see if it can help shore up that defense a little bit. And you, Jason, your thoughts. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, Vic Beasley is, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't move the needle too much for me. I mean, I, I think, I think Tennessee's defense will be what it's going to be because Mike Vrabel's running it and, and, you know, he knows what he's doing on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, I, I just I think signing a guy like Beasley just speaks more to the point that they want to run the football and play good defense. Yeah, yeah, of of course. Um, Vic Beasley he has done good things in Atlanta. Um, and I I couldn't agree with that statement more. Um, running down the list still the Redskins on defense sign former Panther Thomas Davis. Um, this is becoming like the. Carolina Redskins, so to speak. You know, you got Ron Rivera, Kyle Allen, now Thomas Davis. Any more Panthers getting signed by the Redskins? I don't know. Is this a questionable decision by the Redskins here, gentlemen? <laughs> I, mean, mm. <laughs> I mean, okay, let's let's to answer your question, is it a questionable decision by the Redskins? No. Would it be it's a questionable decision? Right. Would it be a questionable decision by any other well-run franchise in the NFL? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is why the Redskins are the ones that always make these decisions. I don't get I it. I don't. I don't. Josh. I mean, they're they're just right now. I mean, they're they're just a ship without a runner, man. I mean, and and then they got the whole Trent Williams drama that's going to be. Whew. Play Don't out. get me started on that. Trent Williams is a gone. <laughs> to cut his him off and cut his losses. <laughs> yeah, I mean they they need. Well, he's never gonna. He'll never play another game in a Redskins uniform. So they might as well just do uh, what be done. What must be done eventually must be done now. So just just you know, rip the band aid, do it, and get on with it. Yeah, that, that's a good analogy. That's a really good analogy for Trent. Strip it off. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Saints on defense signing Malcolm Jenkins from the Eagles. I I, I really like that move for the Saints. Um, as mm-hmm. you said earlier, Jason, the Saints are becoming more and more of a complete football team. Yeah, I mean, he's he's getting up there in years, and obviously he had some good years in New Orleans. Um, you know, he, he's he'll be thirty three in December. Um, you know, and, and the only thing that worries me with, with this is the Eagles secondary has been so bad. I mean, it's been such a sieve and they were willing to let him walk. Um, I, I don't know what Malcolm Jenkins has left in the tank. Um, but I also don't know that new Orleans needs him to come in and be a three down defensive back. Um, Although I mean they signed him what four years thirty two million, um, and obviously I would have to look and see what his what his actual contract looks like. But um, yeah, I, I just you know sometimes when these guys go back to you know go back to places where they had some success early in their career. I mean obviously Malcolm Jenkins is a strong player, um, and they, I'm looking at the contract right now. So essentially this is a two year deal. Um, worth seven million and, and he's only he's only on the books next year for three point three million. That's his cap number. So I, I mean I, I think a team friendly deal probably given um you know given what Malcolm Jenkins is gonna be for them. Um and you know anything he provides on the back end of that defense is gonna be a plus, honestly. Yeah, so um Malcolm Jenkins to the Saints um Next one I really want to dive into deep here is the Bears make a trade for former Eagle and former Jaguar Nick Foles. This is a knock at the door for Mitchell Trubisky because Mitchell Trubisky finally has somebody trying to compete for the starting job. And if Mitch Trubisky can't step up his game, Nick Foles will be the new starter in Chicago. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good point. Um you know, Nick Foles is such an interesting player to me because he seems to have 
throughout his career kind of been a kind of the right place, right time sort of guy. Um, you know, he, of course, he's well known for that Super Bowl run he had with the Eagles in 20, uh, 2018, um, especially late in the season when he took over. But, you know, outside of that, he had that unbelievable season in 2013, which we all remember the with the uh, game he threw, what was it, six touchdowns in one game or something like that, tied the record. Um, and, uh, you know, finished with 27 touchdowns and two picks in that season. Um, you know, outside of that, he really has been an underperforming quarterback. So um, I don't really see him as the starter, but funnier things have happened. And Mitchell Trubisky, he really digressed this past season. Uh, I felt like he was really, he could really uh, step up um, and start to show that he could be the franchise quarterback for the Bears, and he just didn't do it. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see sort of like a two-quarterback system. Um, you know, the Bears are kind of a mess, I think, anyways. Um, even though they've been on the cusp of the playoffs and they're really not a terrible franchise by any stretch of the imagination, um, th they still have some stuff to work out. So I don't really understand this move. I'll sum it up like that. Um, you know, Nick Foles just – I hope he likes – I hope he keeps his house on the market all the time because who knows where he's going to end up next. He seems to move a lot. So um, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens this season. That was very rude. <laughs> <laughs> I hope his I, house is always on the market. Uh, what a way to I talk. apologize. Well, <laughs> I just well, thought that was him. hilarious. <laughs> I try to, I, I try to have a funny moment now and then on this show. You know that. Yeah. Um, Next on the on tap, the Seahawks um, signed Bruce Irvin. Um, the Seahawks, I I think in my opinion, need some more defenders. The Legion of Boom's gone, but um, you got the Griffin twins. Bruce Irvin could really help their defensive lot a lot. Um, your thoughts on this, Jason? Uh, I mean, I think Bruce Irvin's a situational pass rusher. I, I you know, he's a, it, he just, you know, Bruce Irvin's, I think, 32. So, um, it's hard to believe that he's already that old, but, uh, you know, I, those guys, defensive players in their, in their 32, 33, 34 year old season, uh, you know, I get a little bit concerned with because at some point they just run out of juice. And, you know, when you're playing on the defensive line and you're getting hit a lot, you get cut a lot. And, um, you know, I, again, it, it's not a, it's not a signing to me that's going to, you know, somehow make the Seahawks defense, a, you know, a, a juggernaut. I mean, I, I think he's a situational pass rusher. I think, um, you know, I think he might be a little bit of insurance, um, you know, for in the event that Javon Clowney would not, you know, not make his way back there for some reason point so uh, i don't know it's 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 just kind of one of those things where i don't i don't think that i don't think bruce Irvin's going to make or break the seattle defense this year good point there good point there i couldn't agree more with that but um the eagles they might have a key defenseman from why did I say defenseman? I mean, defender, <laughs> Darius Slay from Detroit for a third and a fifth round pick, three years, $50 million. Um, is this too much for Darius Slay, Dan? Or do you do you think the Eagles picked up Darius Slay at a good price? Uh, I think it's a tad bit high, uh, but I, I, I will say he's kind of been under the radar. Um, and... I, I feel like in the years um, he, he played for the Lions, he's probably their best defender and, and probably um, one of the best um, in that division at, at his position. Um, I know that's kind of a, kind of a controversial, controversial remark, but um, I, I think he's a pretty solid player. I think he can really help their defense. And a lot, and a lot of people just don't give him enough credit because after all, he does play for the Lions. So um you know, he's been a pro bowler the last three seasons and he's really kind of come into his own. Um, I think he can really help, help them. Like I said, I think the, I think I agree that the price is a little bit too high. Um, he hasn't really shown that he's worth that kind of money, but I, I think if they can continue to develop him, I think he can, 
think he can uh, be be worth the money for sure. And Jason, you were talking about how the Eagles' defense was struggling. Do you think this is a move they needed to um, help the defense out a little bit more? Well, I think this is a great move. Anytime you can get a a top ten corner for essentially like two mid round draft picks, um, I think this is a great deal for Philadelphia. Um, again, you know, when you're looking at this, essentially a two year deal. Um, he's his cap number this year is only four million, which you know for a Philadelphia team that's that is a little bit up against it. This is a very friendly deal for them this year. Um, you know they, so I think this is a great move for them. I mean he's he's 29, so you know he's got some juice left. Um, so bring him in, and, and Philadelphia that I think has actually done a, a a pretty nice job trying to um bolster the secondary and and you know it's not often that you can get a guy like Darius Slay um you know at the price especially if they got him from but it's not often that you can just kind of fall into a to a guy like this um so I from Philadelphia standpoint I like the move a lot uh and and I think um I, I think it's obviously I mean it's going to help their defense and honestly it can't get worse um because they were, from a from a passing standpoint, um, they they were essentially a they were like the course field um, of pass defenses. I mean, when you were playing DFS, I mean you loaded up on whoever whoever was going against Philadelphia um, because typically they were going to eat. So, um, yeah, I mean I love the move honestly. And, you know, they still have about $28 million in cap space, so they can go out and get somebody else if they need to. But, um, you know, they also just signed Jalen Mills, too, which looks like they're going to slot him over to uh, to safety. Um, you know, but he can, he can probably play in the slot a little bit. I mean, I, I think I think they've made some some moves probably in the past two weeks to, to really put themselves in a better position in that division, which, honestly, if we're looking at it, that division's bad. Yeah, yeah if you're talking about the NFC, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that's not a surprise to me. <laughs> All right, moving oh, on. Um, we talked about Dallas and their cap space. The Rams cap space hit them hard. They released both Todd Gurley and Clay Matthews. Todd Gurley ends up signing a one-year deal with the Atlanta Falcons. Um, I like Todd Gurley to the Falcons. I think um, it could give the Falcons a new running back. Um, yeah, you know, I think he'll perform well with the Falcons and I think, um, it'll have a lot of great yards and maybe this is room to give, um, for the Falcons to get their next, um, star running back. Um, not sure if you all agree with that, but, um, those are just my thoughts and Clay Matthews. I mean, yeah, he, I don't think he really did. He's that done. Great. Yeah, he's done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I figured that, but it, since you spoke first, Dan, um, you have the floor on Todd Gurley and Clay Matthews. I agree with you. I think Todd Gurley gives another dimension to that Falcons offense. Um, they've been trying to find, um, you know, trying to make their offense as well rounded as possible, obviously, and um, I, I think it's a decent move. You know, he definitely. Um, he definitely digressed a little bit this year. Todd Gurley did. Um, trying to remember, did he um, did he hold out or something last year? There was some reason. Or maybe was it him or somebody else? That was, um, Gurley did not hold out. I think you're talking about Melvin Gordon. Oh yeah, shoot. Um. Anyways, yeah, yeah, you're right. That's my bad. It's been it's been too long. <laughs> um <laughs> yeah, I mean he he had 12 touchdowns last year, but you know, the Rams the Rams didn't really feed him enough, I don't think. I they really didn't give him the rock as much as they had um and really tried to give you know put a lot more pressure on Jared Goff to make plays. Um and I I think at this point Atlanta Atlanta's going to be running the football a lot more, I think now, especially with with the age Matt Ryan is and just what they have at um at the running back position, I think we'll see the Falcons 
utilize him more. I, I think it's a pretty good move um, for both sides, or I, I'd say it's a pretty good move for Atlanta. I think uh, I think the Rams just kind of misused him in the in the last season there. So um, we'll see if he can sort of find that fire again in, in Atlanta. And I, I really think he can. I think he can. I think he still can be productive. I think he can continue to to ball out, and we'll see if um, you know if he can he can go off this year. I think especially in that division outside of the Saints, it's um, you know the defenses are kind of kind of tricky to figure out right now. So I I think Tug really could really could really be great this year. Yeah, absolutely. And Jason, let's turn to you about the cap space for the Rams. Um, this obviously frees up some cap space, but what's the next move here for Los Angeles? Uh, to trade Brandon Cooks because he's owed a ton of money and he wants out. And, you know, I think, I mean, when you've got Robert Woods and you've got Cooper Cup um, already in the fold, if they trade if they trade Brandon Cooks after June 1st, he's only a $4.8 million cap hit and dead money. Um, the question is, can they find a trade partner that would that would want a wide receiver? And I mean, Cooks can be productive. Um, you know, when when he, um, I mean, he's been productive. He's and he's only you know 27, so um, it's it's not like I mean, he's still got a lot left in the tank. Um, it's just they're gonna have to find the right team to take him on. I mean, the first team, honestly, that comes to mind for me is Indianapolis. Get him on that turf. Um, with T.Y. Hilton and just let you know let Philip Rivers do what he does and just throw it all over the place. But um, I think I think that that's probably going to be where St. Louis looks to go next, just because Cooks wants out and he's got the highest cap hit of the of the other you know the three wide receivers. Um, and just talking about Gurley real quick, I think the question we got asked about Todd Gurley is how's his knee? Um, a big part of the reason he didn't get fed last year is because he wore down so much the year before that in the, in the run of the Super Bowl. And if you recall. Um, you know, even in the Super Bowl that year, he went from being like a 30 touch guy, um, all the way up to like week 12 when he got hurt to being like a 12 touch guy in the playoffs. So I think last year was a lot of load management, uh, on the Rams part with Gurley and it, and, and, you know, he still had a, I mean, he had an okay year. I mean, his yards for carry were way down and he just, he, the, where he, where he really fell off was he just was not involved in the passing game last year at all. Um, so I think I think what's going to happen in Atlanta this year is I think they'll probably ride him to the wheels fall off because it's a one year deal, um, and get out of him what they can get out of him, and um, you know he he could be a nice buy low candidate for people in, in redraft and dynasty football. Um, but but I think the question you know we got to look at with Gurley is obviously the health. But it, yeah, going back to the Rams, I mean their their cap situation is not great. I mean they've only got about six million dollars nine or seven million dollars in space right now. So if they're able to offload Cooks, um, you know, that opens them up a little bit. But, you know, they, they signed um, – you know, they, they're going to have to sign Jalen Ramsey coming up here because his contract's due at the end of this year. Um, you know, they, they, they already invested in golf. So um, they've, just, they've just got some big contracts coming up here um, that, that they're going to have to address. And, and I think moving Cooks is the guy that makes the most sense. Good, good stuff there, Jason. Um, so moving on now, Dan, you mentioned um somebody holding out that was Melvin Gordon from mm-hmm. the Chargers. <laughs> um, the Broncos ended up signing Melvin Gordon on a two-year, sixteen million dollar contract. Um, good move, bad move there, Dan. Your thoughts? I think it's a good move. Um, I think the Broncos need help on offense. Um, Philip Lindsay, you know, was, was kind of the guy the last, the last, I think the last couple of years now, um, yeah, Lindsay but, was, but, you know, they've kind of shuffled guys in though. And, and they have, haven't really had a consistent, uh, running back. Who's sort of an every down guy. I think Melvin Gordon can give them that edge. Um, I think it's a good move for them, especially their quarterback situation right now. Um, it looks like it's just going to be Drew Locke, um, but you, you know you have Case Keenum now, so um, it's kind of it, they seem like they're going to be like a, a run first offense anyways, and I, I think this this kind of shores that up and kind of gives them an opportunity to um, to explore some different things and try to use Melvin Gordon in the uh, in the in the run game as, as well as the passing game as um, 
as they try to figure out what they're going to do this season on offense. Um, they're kind of rebuilding as well. So um, I think I think this is a good move for the Broncos. I think they I think similar to um, excuse me, similar to the uh, the previous the previous move that we talked about, which I'm already forgetting. What the heck? Gurley. Um, yeah, Gurley. Gur- yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sim- similar to that. You're going to see the Broncos just kind of work him um, and use him in any way they can because, let's face it, their offensive weapons are very limited. They really don't have much to show for right now. And, you know, they – again, the, the young quarterback really makes a big difference. They, they need all the help they can get. So, um, I, I think it's a great move for them. It's, it's a two-year deal, so I think that's right in the kind of ballpark you're looking for too. Um, so I think, I think the Broncos got a pretty big win with this one. And what about you, Jason? Um, I, I know you were talking about Melvin Gordon a lot, um, last fantasy season and how he held out and Austin Eckler was the next man up for, um, the Chargers. So, um, what do you think about this move going to Denver? Yeah, Josh. I mean, I, I think what this does, this probably signals a, um, commitment to Drew Locke for one. Obviously, with them releasing Flacco, they've kind of already played their hand there. But you know, Philip Lindsay had a thousand yard rushing. Um, you know, his first two years in the league, and they still opted to bring in Melvin Gordon. So I think mm-hmm. I think what you're what you're going to see here is a team that wants to probably run the ball. Um, you know, forty five, forty to forty five percent of the time. Um, you know, they're, they're not going to want Drew Locke to drop back and throw the ball 35 or 40 times. They're going on the ball a ton. Um, I I actually think the Broncos have some nice young weapons on offense between Cortland Sutton and Noah Fant. Um, but it's it's not going to be a, you know, let's try to outgun somebody. Um, you know, they also brought in A.J. Boyer from, from Jacksonville, um, you know, to kind of, kind of replace Chris Harris who signed with uh with the Chargers but uh but, but I think what what Denver want to do is try to control the clock run the football um some shots of Drew Locke when they have to uh downfield with Cortland Sutton who is an absolute beast um probably see Noah Fant get a little bit more involved they're still looking for a wide receiver too which they can obviously address in the draft um but they're another team. I mean, they, they've got some cap space. I mean, they got 21 million this year and I mean, they got a ton next year. So, um, I mean, they, they have some cap space. Um, you know, maybe they're interested in a guy like Brandon cooks and, and maybe, you know, flip him for a third or fourth round pick. Although, you know, I know they flipped a couple of mid round picks or boy already. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't love the signing just because I like Philip Lindsay. But I understand the signing because Melvin Gordon is an established veteran NFL running back, uh, and on a two-year deal that's really cheap, um, I, I think it makes a ton of sense from that perspective. So, but if you're Melvin Gordon, man, I mean, how how sickening is this that you get that you get a two-year deal, um, you know, for 16 million when you were hoping to probably get about 16 million a year last year at this time? Yeah, absolutely. And um, d- going back to what you said about Noah Fant, I think he really helped the Broncos out a lot last season. I think he's going to do great things this season. Uh, the Broncos, I think they're rebuilding still, but um, with the addition of Melvin Gordon, I think they're going to switch out Gordon and Lindsey. Um, um, if they choose Gordon over Lindsay more, I think Lindsay is going to be the third down back in that situation. But I think they can run well with a two running back scheme in Denver. Yeah, and I don't think that I think I think Denver thinks they can that they can compete for a playoff spot in that division because the Chargers the Chargers are going to be really bad um, unless they bring in a veteran quarterback, but if they decide they're just going to, they're just going to play Tyrod Taylor, the Chargers are going to be bad. Um, and the Raiders are going to be bad. So I don't, I don't think that, I don't think the Broncos are looking at this, like this is a, the, this is a rebuild. I think the Broncos think if some things go right, they can make the playoffs. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think they're looking at this as like a long-term thing. I think they think that this, this could, and signing Melvin Gordon tells me that. You don't sign a guy like Melvin Gordon because you think you're just going to go in the tank for two years. Um, and and I think, you know, bringing in A.J. Boye, 
um, in a trade. I, I think they think they can compete right now. And I think they think Drew Locke can get them there, honestly. Wow. Yeah, that, that's really bold. Um, yeah, I, it, it could happen the way that division is, in my opinion. I, I don't think, but I, I, I think they have the right mindset. Um, Vic Fangio, um, he's an established coach, still relatively new, but, you know, I, I, I think he can work well with the players and, um, get the Broncos to where they need to be. But um, uh, Jason, as a sports podcaster, I have to say this. It is Tyrod Taylor, not Tyrod Taylor. Always, It's always Tyrod to me. It, yeah, it, same. Tyrod, we saw that on Hard Knocks, if you watched <laughs> Hard Knocks. <laughs> it's always, it's always going to be Tyrod to me. But everyone still calls him Tyrod, so it never really caught on, I don't think. Yeah, it's yeah, always it, going to be Tyrod it, to me. Didn't, it didn't catch you on at Virginia Tech, Dan, so I'm nope, not sure. Nope, everyone still calls him Tyrod down there. <laughs> yeah, you know, I I completely missed this point. T- Tyrod Taylor mm-hmm. taking the starting position in Los Angeles for the Chargers. Do you think that's going to stick, or are the Chargers going to draft somebody else? Because Ty- uh, Tyrod, excuse me, um, he, <laughs> I, I think – I, I felt like he would have played great for the Browns, but, you know, the Browns brought in Baker Mayfield. The Browns were the Browns, yeah. Yeah, yeah the Browns were the Browns. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. D- Dan, do you think Tarod can play well in Los Angeles, or do you think they're going to bring in somebody new? I do. I, I, I'm confident that Tyrod Taylor, he hasn't really had a lot of opportunities. Um, and, you know, when he, when he did play um, – when he did start with some sort of consistency with uh, the Bills, I think that was the last team really he uh, played more than – yeah, he was. He started 14 games in uh, 2017 and 15 and uh, 2016. He, he, was, he was pretty good. I mean, he wasn't – Yeah, they had a winning record that season, didn't they? Yep, they did. And, um, you know, so he's never really – he's really only had three seasons where he's had some extensive playing time. It was when he was in Buffalo. Um, and like I said, he, he was average, I guess, if you look at the numbers, uh, but you know, it, he didn't really have much to work with in those years. Um, so I, I do think, I do think it's going to work out. I think it's going to go pretty well. Um, there's going to be some bumps in the road. I think obviously the first, the first time he's really had the spotlight on him as a quarterback, um, for some extensive amount of time. So, um, I, th- I think the chargers, you know they're they're not a team that's gonna, you know, be a playoff contender obviously right now. Um, but I I think Tyrod Taylor can perform and I think he can prove that, you know, he could be a starting quarterback. Maybe not the long long term, but he can be the starting quarterback just, you know, four or five seasons, however long. Um, he'll be there. So, um, you know, he's 30 years old. He's finally getting an opportunity to, to start. Um, I can't. I just don't – I still don't know why the Bills – you know, I, I think I think the Bills wanted to draft somebody, obviously, and that's why they kind of got rid of Tyrod. But um, I'm glad he gets an opportunity for the Chargers. He deserves it. And I, I think he can – I think he can play pretty consistently for them uh, this coming up season. And a- anything more to add to that, Jason? Give me Cam Newton in San Diego. San Diego? Los Angeles, what a, it's always San Diego to me. It's always San Diego, exactly. Then you say San Diego, Jason. I mean, it's my goodness. Give me, give me Cam Newton in a Chargers uniform, and they are scary good. Scary good. Depends on how healthy he is. Cam Newton's gonna ball. I'm telling you, Cam Newton's gonna ball wherever he goes. Depending on how healthy he is. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm 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 fifty fifty. I'm on right now. That too. No offense, yeah. but I'm this, just this man was was working out yesterday to gospel music in I his saw garage. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> listen, the Cam Cam Newton is going to boys. He he is going to ball out somewhere this year. It's going to be vintage Cam. He is going to be. He's going to land on every one of my fantasy teams because nobody's going to pick him. 
and I'm going to get him in the last round like I did Lamar Jackson next year, and it's going to be beautiful. Cam Newton, I'm telling you right now, come back player of the year. <laughs> that better write another it down, bold Josh. statement by <laughs> write it down. Kowski. I like it. I like it though. I like I like the bold statement. I do. Hey, no, I do. I can see it. I I I can see it. I'm not saying it's you know it's impossible. I I think it's so I think it's good. very possible. Because so everyone's counting them out too. So I'm writing that so down good. right now. Bold statement by J Cam. <laughs> March 27th at 9:31 p.m. Cam Newton comeback player of the year. I, I'm writing that down right now, but um, Keep it. <laughs> okay. So we're moving on here to the last two signings that I have documented. The last two moves. Well, I'll just go down the last two really quickly. The Raiders signed Nelson Aguilar from the Eagles, and the Cowboys signed defensive tackle Dontari Poe. That's the last two I have. Uh, let's just really quickly. Um, get thoughts uh, about these two moves. Meh. I mean, Aguilar can't yeah. catch, and Poe's 100 years old. <laughs> I was going right. to say that, too. I think, uh, I think Aguilar, you're either going to see him basically catch no passes this year, or you're going to see him somehow, like, explode and, like, come out of nowhere and just ball out. So, um yeah, I'm not sure. I, I the Raiders seem to be throwing a lot of money out there in free agency this year, and uh, you know it's obvious that they they think they they see something in him, but I don't know what. Um, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see if it works out. But I'm not a huge fan of that signing. And then yeah, I, <laughs> I think Don Terry Poe is like in his like 15th season or something. He's he's up there. Um, I didn't even know he's still in the league. So that's that's good to know. Well, in, in, interesting. Um, geez, oh, he's not as old as I thought he was. He's only he's only twenty nine, but it seems like he's been in the league a lot longer than that. So, <laughs> oh my. it seems like it's been a lot longer. Yeah, uh, no, I, I know that that was quick. So, gentlemen, before we move on to our last segment here, are there any signings that I missed that you all saw that I didn't see? I've been researching this for the past couple of days, but I just want to make sure we give our fans everything free agency wise. I think you covered all the ones, uh, the the major ones, and then a lot of the smaller ones that uh, that were out there. So I, I think you did a good job. And l- let me just explain this. The reason why I cover the smaller ones too, it's everything free agency. I mean, yeah. I- even if we didn't talk about it much, it's sports news that I wanted to get out there because it's everything. There's not a lot going on too, so that's that adds another level to it too. You kind of yeah. have to keep it keep it rolling. So yeah, hey, hey Josh, yeah, you you missed one, and I and I'm starting to think this is an anti Steelers podcast. <laughs> oh no, no, the Watt brothers. No, Eric Ebron. I did not oh, hear I did not hear not about even, that. Didn't even know that one. I apologize Two years, as well. 12 million. Yeah, Eric Ebron. Well, so, that, that sounds like a good pickup. Well, would you like deal, Jason? What do you think? So, yeah, let's talk so, about your Steelers. Well, this is just this is just a quick take, and I mean, I, and and I've I've been on another pause to talk about this already. Um, so they've already got Vance McDonald, who mm-hmm. um, he can't stay healthy either. Eric Ebron can't stay healthy. So I think I think what they're honestly banking on is they will get 16 games of either McDonald or Eric Ebron, and I I think that's their hope. Um, you know it's it's a it's a very low risk deal. Two years, 12 million is not a bunch. I mean the Steelers are always up against it in the cap, and they figure it out. Um, but but I think I think what they see in Eric Ebron is a guy that they can bring in, be a good red zone target for Ben. Um, and and he and Vance McDonald can kind of maybe play some mismatch stuff because um, for tight ends they both move really well and they're both big bodied guys who run well. So um, you know I I like it um, considering what the the tight end situation was in Pittsburgh last year. That was probably one of their most glaring needs um, going into the draft. And considering they don't have a first round pick because they traded it for Minka Fitzpatrick, um, I mean I'll take it. I was I was pleasantly surprised when I saw it come across the ticker. So. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, you know, it's not one of those things where I'm like, ooh, you know, Super Bowl bound because we signed Derek Ebron. But at the same time, I thought, you know what, they addressed the need um, with probably the best tight end on the market. So I'll take it. All right. Uh, l- l- let me go a little bit off topic here, Jason. How do you like Ben Roethlisberger's beard? <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So so right now, my friends and I, like our goal during quarantine is to grow a mustache. So like that's that's like our thing. Like we're all grown mustaches. And so like like I love Ben Roethlisberger and the way he looks right now. Like I hope and it's not gonna happen because he'll trim it before training camp, but he looks like a mixture of Ron Burgundy and Yukon Cornelius off of Rudolph the Red Nose Reindeer. Like he does look like Yukon Cornelius. <laughs> I love his beard. Like I love it. And yeah, it's just it's awesome. It's awesome. He's gonna look so different when it comes off, but I bet his wife hates it. God, I bet she hates it. <laughs> well, he should he should throw some conditioner in there because the one video, I mean, it looked a little looked a little scraggly, looked a little dry. Oh, he was looking like that. Happy Gilmore's caddy in the one video. I mean, he yeah, was yeah like exactly. Big. Yeah, he was looking rough. He was looking rough. Yeah, I was like, come on, man, you got to keep yeah. up with it. <laughs> yeah, he just got done working yeah. out. You know, had, oh, there there's like animals living inside of it. It's awesome. Oh yeah, I mean, no doubt. <laughs> a chipmunk is burrowed in there and has like stuff stored in there for the winter time. It's great. <laughs> Hey, hey, Ben should have Troy Palomalu come over and give him head and shoulders. Give him for- some head and shoulders. <laughs> Do something. Hey, honestly, he should trim it because they're saying the coronavirus, like you need to trim your facial mm-hmm. hair. Like that's what they're saying. Yeah. Like, you know, Ben, if you're listening to this, please trim your beard. You <laughs> you are going – next year is our year, Super Bowl bound. Trim beard we cannot go through another season with mason rudolph and duck duck hodges please no you what, can't put As yourself in fan, i agree ass, <laughs> god just do whatever you need to get healthy and stay healthy trim that beard put yourself in bubble wrap stay inside eat whatever you want to eat but just when training camp rolls around just show up there and, and do your thing man there you go all right all righty, <laughs> let's, let's move on. Um, another segment I wanted to incorporate into the podcast. Um, due to the coronavirus, um, as most of you know, um, the XFL cut their season midway through. And the XFL was gracious enough to let players sign to the NFL Um you know, and I, I believe they're making money or income off of that. I'm not sure if the XFL players that are staying behind are still getting paid or whatnot. But um, a big move, uh, the Houston Roughnecks quarterback, P.J. Walker, the Panthers signed him from the XFL. And some other teams um, that have signed XFL players so far during this free agency period, the Panthers, obviously, the Chargers, Falcons, Ravens, Steelers, Giants, Vikings, Saints, and Chiefs. They have all signed XFL players during this free agency, which I think is huge. And if the XFL can keep doing what they do and they'll still have enough funding for the next couple of seasons, who knows? This could be a minor league to the NFL. Um, I mean, PJ Walker is as good as any backup. I think mm-hmm. that, that you could find. I mean, PJ Walker was incredible for Houston. Um, I, I mean, I would take PJ Walker over Rudolph or Duck Hodges in Pittsburgh today. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, and I mean that. I think I liked the NFL or the uh, the XFL product. I, I thought it was a I thought it was a good product, and I thought I thought it was, I mean, it was raw, it was real. Um, I, I thought it was great. I mean, I was looking forward to going down to some games in DC before all this hit. Um, yeah, same here. I, yeah, I think I think it's great, and I think it's going to survive because people are just this country is so starved for football, man. Especially the time of year they were playing, like. That time between from the Super Bowl to like opening day of baseball, like this country just is starved for something other than NBA and college basketball. And and they just I think the product is good enough to survive. So I, I'm looking forward to next year. I liked it. 
Yeah, I'm looking forward to it too. You know, like the media coverage, there was pretty much un, unlimited media coverage. I mean, the players don't care. One player got ejected. He's walking off the field, signing autographs and taking an interview. That's <laughs> something you'll never see in the National Football League because yeah, yeah, it's all definitely. business. Yeah. There's a beer cup snake in Washington. Those fans are more rowdy than FedEx Field ever will be. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Like Jason yeah. said, they're creating a great product. Yep. I, I, and I really and do people like are coming to the games. I mean, people are filling the stadiums, not like full capacity, but like if you watch that first uh, week, um, just the first uh, DC Defenders game, I was surprised how full the stadium was. Yeah, um, I was too. And Audi Field isn't that b- big. That's where DC United plays. Right, but, uh, right. But still, even still, I, I mean, I they were able impressed. to do a good job. Yeah. I was really impressed. Well. And, like, mm-hmm. and like the access there is and everything. I mean, this is all stuff I've talked about before, but still, it, it was really good. Well, the DC yeah. kind of did it right, putting it in a stadium that size, because you're not gonna you're not gonna get a hundred thousand people to an XFL game. Right? Yeah, you can, uh, you can get like twenty five thousand. Yes, yeah, Seattle yeah. just opened the lower bowl of CenturyLink Field, and yeah, yeah I mean, and and New York did the same. New York, yeah. Um, you know, and I, I think that's that's where it's at. I mean, and you you put them in some of these smaller venues that are still major professional sports venues. And let's face it, the Chargers played the last two years in a soccer stadium too. So and it's they, not like it's they, they didn't draw as many out. fans. Right, they didn't draw as many fans as DC. Man, the Chargers are gonna be hurting when they move in that stadium. Oof, mm-hmm. it's gonna be bad. It's gonna be bad. It's gonna be rough. That stadium looks nice, though. You gotta admit that that is oh, a very nice stadium. Yeah. Brand new. It better be nice. I mean, it's, it's very nice, but, but I mean, they, it's just a bad deal for them. The Spanish family is terrible, but that's, that's a tangent for another day. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, gentlemen, unless I have missed anything, I think that concludes our free agency in review. Um, yeah. I think that's it. Yeah. So we got it. Yeah. We covered it all. We covered it all. That's free agency. Um, I hope this really um helped you get out of the cabin fever if you are home in quarantine. Once again, we hope you are staying safe out there during this time of social separation. Um it this was a lot of fun, I I gotta say, guys. But first off to the fans. Thanks once again for hanging tight. Um, we had some technical difficulties, but we got through it and we produced a really great podcast, in my opinion. I could not have done it without the help of my man Jason Kamlowski and podcast contributor Dan Dembski. Jason, starting with you, any last words for the podcast? Um, just be safe out there, guys. Do do what they're telling us to do. Um, you know practice social distancing so we can get so we can get past this thing and get back to get back to our normal lives and and have a sense of of normalcy and and hopefully getting some sports back on and and just being able to go out and do what we love to do so you know if we if we suffer through it for about a month i think we'll be able to get back to normal by the end of may yeah i i I know what you mean i i i I just remember you crying in the closet yesterday jason because yesterday would have been opening day but there is no baseball rough (laughs) 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 yeah but uh nothing new to look forward to in the pittsburgh pirates but go nationals (laughs) world series champions yeah uh... oh boy Oh sorry. yeah, sorry Dan, you're an Orioles fan. There, yeah, um, I, I really Irish can't laugh bit better either. Than men, them, Josh. If there's no base season, the only thing you have to look forward to is the Redskins. So, I mean, <laughs> that's right. uh, you better hope there's baseball this year. I, I'm enjoying the off season, Jason. Why do you? Why do you <laughs> put the Redskins? Probably, Jason. He's probably watching old old Caps games too. I mean, Dude, that's, that's know, the other thing he's doing. Yeah. No, I'm watching yeah. the cat. The NHL 20 simulations on NBC Sports <laughs> Washington. You got there the you cast go. announcer calling in any cool. simulation. Like, yeah, th- cool. can it get any better than that? I mean, yeah, um, they could actually play. 
Yeah. Well, and you can go watch the 2000, uh, what, 2017 Stanley Cup Finals. That was a pretty good one. No, the 2018. <laughs> yeah, correction, 2018. Thank you very much. I lose track of all ours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, well, we're getting way off track here, but this is so much fun. Dan Dembski, any last yeah. words for the podcast? Um, no, I, I think Jason pretty much said what exactly what I was going to say as far as, you know, just, uh, you know, take, take, take care of yourselves and don't just think about yourself, but think about your neighbor and, and think about those who, um, you know, are elderly or have autoimmune diseases or asthma, um, pre-existing conditions that, you know, could make it a lot worse than, if someone who's healthy would contract COVID-19. So um, just think about the, just think about the, the well-being of everyone, everyone, not just yourself. And, um, you know, I think, I think if we use a little bit of uh, compassion and um, patience during this time, it'll, it'll all go well. And I, I think the end of May would be fantastic if we could get, get back to somewhat normalcy by then. So, and sports as well. We need some sports back because, there's just nothing right now, man. It's hard to find stuff to do. Hey, NFL Game Pass, that's what you got to do. Oh, I know. I have it, man. I've been been uh, watching some random games, so I, I like it, though. It, it's awesome. It's awesome, I got to say. But um, Al, Al, I'm just going to say what these two said. Uh, stay safe out there. Um, I have heard Carl Anthony Towns and his mother is in a coma due to COVID-19. Mm. Prayers up to Carl Anthony Towns. And Doris Burke contracted the coronavirus. Prayers to Doris Burke along with everybody else suffering. If anybody, any family, anybody um, who's going through this tough time, if um, you have somebody who has coronavirus or anything, However you may be affected, the, our thoughts and prayers from the Josh Kirby on Sports Podcast go out to everybody affected by this um, virus. Why did I say disease? My gosh. But Well, it is technically a disease, too. Oh, yeah. it is? Yeah, okay. technically. Okay, yeah. A a anyways, we're dragging this on and on and on. But <laughs> for Jason Kamlowski and Dan Dembski, I'm Josh Kirby. As always, we're part of the Mayo Please Podcast Network. You can check them out on all streaming platforms along with Twitter and Instagram. We're part of, yes, we're part of the Mayo Please, and we're sponsored by Route 11 Ships. Make sure you find a bag today inside your local Martin's Food Lion and Giant Stores. We're also sponsored by PM Plus Reserves. Big thanks, as always, to uh, JR Beats Official, MPT Now Productions, and Dave Johnson for all their support of the podcast. Um, due to COVID-19, I'm not really sure the direction the podcast will be taking next, but I promise you this, we will be back. I'm not sure when, but we will be back. We just got to find some great content to bring out to the fans. Because, it, you know, the fans, um, we've been through a lot, and I appreciate all the support. So you can find us all streaming platforms and all social media platforms via the Josh Kirby on Sports Podcast. Till the next time, stay safe, um, practice social distancing, and we hope to be back with you soon. So long, and peace out.